You can get started. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to the penultimate session in this complications on upper limb surgery uh, series that is being brought to you by the EO North America Hand Education Committee. The last five weeks have been enormously educational as well as humbling because we've seen all the kinds of things that can go uh, not quite right. And uh, luckily for us, we had super faculty who told us what can be done to make them better. Today's session is one more that all of us have faced and will probably face in the future, the miserable elbow after soft tissue surgery. Marco Rizzo is the moderator and has assembled superb faculty for the same. And I think you're going to learn a lot of uh, really interesting things from this session. So Marco, take care everybody. Thanks, Jay. Um, again, welcome. Uh, I'll reiterate Dr. Margot's uh, sentiments. This has been an outstanding series. Uh, and. Um, we have one more session after this week, but today yeah, we're going to focus on um, the miserable uh, elbow after soft tissue surgery, which <clears throat> sadly, uh, many of these conditions are quite common. So uh, you'll see them in your practice and, uh, and uh, unfortunately uh, are vulnerable to complications, both uh, with regard to management as well as non-management. Um, again, thank you to Dr. Mudgall for his great leadership and our uh, chairing our uh, AO Hand Education Committee. Um, I'll be moderating tonight, and we have a wonderful faculty, uh, in, uh, international as well. So uh, Dr. Mazzaro from the Texas Hand and Arm Center will be um, with us uh, speaking on uh, lateral epicondylitis. Dr. Nick Poulos, my colleague and friend who's uh, here at the Mayo Clinic, is going to be speaking on um, uh, complications associated with biceps tendon, and Dr. Anil Bhatt, also my friend from Manip Manipal, uh, India, is going to speak on um uh, radial tunnel syndrome and uh, its management uh, and complications. Uh, thankfully, uh, no relevant uh, conflicts amongst our group, which is uh, ensuring. And uh, again, you will be uh, eligible for CME credit for this at the end of the series. Um, there will be an evaluation link that is necessary, and upon completion, you will receive a link to claim the credit for access uh, and for a maximum of 8.75 CME credits for this uh, um, webinar series. Um, AO North America is a nonprofit uh, uh, society dedicated primarily to education uh, and care of patients with musculoskeletal injuries. Uh, we do not endorse or promote any product or service and the equipment uh, used for courses when we do have live courses are for teaching purposes only. There is, uh, uh, as many of you who are involved in Zoom uh, type conferences, uh, uh, etiquette that we uh, like to stress, all microphones uh, have been muted and video cameras turned off. Uh, send in questions through a Q&A box, which uh, we will field as, uh, as people present. Um, and at times we'll up the ante and have the, the uh, presenter uh, uh, share live so the rest of the audience can, can see as well. Uh, the moderator will review, that's me, uh, the questions and try to triage them appropriately. And uh, the use of the chat box is reserved uh, for the faculty and staff. Uh, learner objectives are detailed and um, I won't highlight them too much, but basically identify common complications, uh, how to evaluate yeah, each complication, uh, understand uh, modalities for each complication, uh, for a diagnosis and also develop uh, an algorithmic approach to treating each complication. By way of outline, um, I'm in the middle of the introduction. Uh, Dr. Mazzaro will lead us off with a uh, failure of lateral epicondylitis surgery, then Dr. Poulos with the biceps tendon, Dr. Bott with the radial tunnel, and I'll round things out with electronon bursi bursitis. And, um, and then we'll do a, a brief Q&A and I'll have a case to share or two, depending on uh, time permitting. Uh, don't forget next week, uh, we have our final session, uh, uh, Complications After Elbow Fracture Fixation, uh, headed by uh, Dr. Kevin Malone. Um, and that'll be again next Thursday on June 16th. We also have live courses uh, upcoming. Uh, we have uh, one later this month uh, in Tampa. Uh, uh, for uh, fellows and trainees and preparing for life after a hand fellowship. And we have our, one of our uh, very popular often uh, uh, annual courses, which we're resuming now as we uh, work our way out of uh, COVID, 
uh, pandemic, uh, the uh, trauma and flap course, uh, upper extremity trauma and flap course chaired by Drs. Bridgman and Dr. Lawton. That will also be in Tampa, Florida in October. We also have, uh, again, the one last series of this uh, uh, complications, but also there are our our uh, webinars that we routinely do uh, about four per year, five per year. And our next one is on August 10th with DREJ Instability uh, chaired by uh, or moderated by Dr. Jeffrey Greenberg. And October 5th, we'll have uh, uh, management of bone defects in upper limb by Dr. Ree. And finally, the last session of the year for the uh, hand webinars will be on malunions and non-unions by Dr. Jeffrey Lawton moderating. Um, you will be able to access this recording on YouTube uh, 24 hours after the conclusion of this webinar for all those who have registered. And um, also uh, AO Hand and a series podcast will be available uh, on the AO uh, website as well as um, uh, streaming on Apple, Spotify, Amazon, and Google. Um, so without further ado, I will uh, stop sharing my screen and ask uh, Dr. Mazera to um, to uh, start uh, her session, Kim. All right, great, thank you, Marco. So can you all see that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Oh, I see you, I, I need you to hit the share screen button, I'm sorry. Okay, I thought I did, I guess it didn't click, there we go. <laughs> mm. Okay, how's that? That's looking good, uh, it's not on presentation mode just yet, but- um, There we go. Perfect. Better. Very good. All right. Very good. So I'm Dr. Kim Mezzer from Dallas, and uh, I thank uh, Marco for the invitation to talk tonight about failure of lateral epicondylitis surgery. So our objectives tonight are to understand a little bit about the pathoanatomy, like what is this uh, problem, and then understand the scope of the problem. Is it, a, is it a big problem? Is it just a difficult problem? And using a classification system and learning about that to help us in, in evaluating these patients and point us in the right direction, utilizing our exam and then discussing some further treatment options of what we can do to offer these patients some improvement. So briefly about the pathoanatomy, I mean, what is lateral epicondylitis? I mean, it's a bit like a unicorn in that nobody really knows what it is, but if you see it, you recognize it. Um, so we all know that it's, um, involving the extensor carpi radialis brevis tendon. And for some time, traditionally it's been thought of as, or assumed it was an inflammatory condition, but this may not be particularly accurate. Um, Dr. Mori showed that there are at least 14 histopathologic features associated with lateral epicondylitis, which all reflect a healing response but not necessarily an inflammatory response. Things like the fibrinoid and hyaline degeneration, vascular and fibroblastic proliferation, uh, leukocytes, histiocytes, lymphocytes, et cetera. Um, so uh, that's important to know. Now, as far as how common is this problem? Well, lateral epicondylitis is felt by many uh, in the literature to be one of the most common elbow conditions in adults. Um, and, as far as non-operative management goes in the primary presentation, it's roughly successful in 90% of the patients. So of the 10% that don't get better with non-operative management, and they do come to surgical management, 90% of that group is successful as well with, with improvement in their symptoms. And this is shown to be independent of surgical technique, whether it be arthroscopy or an open procedure or placement of an anchor. Um, and Dunn and Nurschel showed in a great study uh, with 10 to 14 year follow-up after primary a surgery for epicondylitis that 97% of their patients reported improvement. But interestingly, only 49% reported being pain-free at the 10 to 14 year follow-up. Uh, so this is an important point, and we'll kind of uh, dive into that a little bit further down, down the talk. So the scope of the problem may be small in numbers, but the patients are difficult to manage, and there may not be a lot of um, reports in the literature to help guide us. And this is a case, I just a case of my own that I wanted to kind of um, throw into this talk because it's exactly the patient type that we're talking about. This patient is a 42-year-old female who presented to me as a second opinion. 
about a year after her index procedure. And she had had an obvious repair with an anchor. And she comes in saying, the pain is actually worse than when I went into the surgery. Uh, and I still can't play tennis. She actually was a tennis player, which uh, was interesting. She tried to play two to three times a week in a community league. And it was one of her hobbies. And she just said, I can't do it. I can't play at all. And so she was quite discouraged. So, and this is the typical patient. I mean, what do you what do you offer them? Where do we go from here when they kind of show up in your, in your office? So I think we start with what is a failure? Like what is a definition of failure of a surgical treatment of tennis elbow? Well, I think there are three important points that we need to uh, talk about in that definition. First of all, residual pain is not necessarily considered a failure. So there's no promise of a pain-free situation. Nurshul described seven phases of pain. And the first three phases, which kind of mild pain or pain with that with without uh, exercise that kind of resolves in 24 to 48 hours um, and does not alter the activity. Patients feel the pain, but they still can do the activity. Unfortunately, those types of pain don't count uh, when we're defining a failure of surgical treatment. It has to be a bit more. It has to be the phases four, five, six, or seven, when there's impact on the ADLs, there's impact in quality of life, there's impact in sleep patterns, work, and uh, things like that. So it has to be significantly disruptive to the patient. The second thing is, how much time do you wait after the initial index procedure? I mean, do you, is it three months? Is it six months, et cetera? Well, Maury recommends waiting six to nine months after the index surgery. And he showed back in 1995 that in a study of their patients, 30% of their patients took greater than six months for maximal improvement. So that is important and that becomes very important in defining and planning uh, to how to care for these patients. Some surgeons even advocate up to 12 months uh, before you consider an additional procedure after the first surgery. And the third point is presentation or development of new symptoms. So something that's different, something that wasn't in the index procedure. So just think about the pain has to be significant at least six months from the time of the initial surgery or the presentation of new symptoms. So how do we evaluate these patients? I mean, often they'll present to your office as a second opinion, perhaps third, even fourth opinion. They may bring in volumes of uh, medical records, MRIs, um, you know, things like that, EMGs. And, and where do we go with that? And they can be, can be quite daunting. I think just the point is to step back and, and, and kind of simplify it. Take a good history. Ask them how they're rehab program was constructed? How did they tolerate it? Were they compliant with their post-operative rehab? Did they ever have a period of uh, pain-free symptoms or of improvement subsequent to their surgery? And get, get a good history um, post-surgery. And then um, look for motives. I mean, this is important. Uh, any litigation involved, any compensation, secondary gain, which kind of segues into patient-specific considerations like narcotic use, depression, anxiety. It's well known that these patients will have less than stellar outcomes uh, with repeat surgery. So it's very, very beneficial to make sure that we check for those things. And then lastly is, and it sounds so simple, but I think step back and start from scratch, a clean slate on the physical exam. Um, don't get caught up and kind of get down the rabbit hole on you know, what's happened before and what have, treatments have you had just kind of start from scratch, do your own assessment, examine the nerve situation, examine for any instability, any joint line tenderness, crepitus, those kind of things that will help you to understand what's happening. And then Dr. Mori puts out the big question. And I think this is um, a simple question, but a very important and pointed question. The question is, and you direct this to the patient, are the symptoms the same as those for which the original surgery was performed, or are they different? And that will help to guide us as the you know, person now faced with kind of the next step to understand and kind of more logically uh, to find a direction to where we go with these people. If the patient says, no, these are exactly the same. It's exactly the same as when I went in, the surgery didn't do anything for me. Well, perhaps we're dealing with one of three things. 
Maybe there was an inaccurate diagnosis. There perhaps was inadequate treatment, maybe either too little treatment or too much treatment. And an improper patient selection may also be throwing a kink in the, in the um, situation. However, if the patient says, no, actually, this is very different. This is a very different pain, as our patient did in my example case. Uh, then we wonder about new pathology. So is there something different? What is different? What has happened uh, since the patient underwent that initial surgery? And that kind of brings us to kind of a flow chart. And I don't expect you guys to, to memorize this or to really absorb all this, but just to show that starting with that one question, are the symptoms the same? Yes or no? And it can lead you in a logical fashion through the kind of jungle of trying to sort these patients out. Back to our patient. So again, her x-rays are on the left side there. And so this is some of her workup. So she, as far as her exam goes, she, or her history goes, she describes pain that's worse than she started with. She said it's, it's worse. She can't play. She can't, um, you know, lift a, a quart of milk out of the refrigerator. She feels like there's something slipping in her elbow. Uh, it just doesn't feel like it's supposed to. And it always feels like it's a little swollen. So when we kind of assess her a little bit further and kind of using the structure and using this exam, like I was talking about, we see that indeed there is something going on. Uh, you know, she has an effusion, the radiocapitellar joint just doesn't look good if you look down here in this section. And so indeed she has some incongruency of her radiocapitellar joint and was having symptoms of instability. So she, um, you know, now we, we realize what, what has happened and that she has different symptoms than she started with. So where do we go from here? Well, I think Dr. Mori kind of gives us some direction. Um, in 1992, he um, proposed a classification system for these patients that had failed surgery on the lateral epicondyle. And he initially described three types. Type one was the type that had an inaccurate diagnosis. Type two had inadequate treatment or incomplete surgery. And type three had iatrogenic problems, meaning they went in with one problem and they came out of the OR with another problem. Um, and over the years, many authors have, have added kind of a type four, which is a little um, addition, which I think is important because it contains that group of patients that have factors, psychosocial issues. They have maybe it's the patient selection issues. Uh, Dr. Mori had many of those in his type one, but they've kind of been pulled out now and have their own type into uh, type four. So this helps to guide us to this next, you know, decision. Do we do we offer an operation? Is is it is it appropriate or do we not? So I think there are four points that will be helpful um, in deciding whether or not the surgery would be an appropriate next step. One is, can we commit to a specific diagnosis? This is very important. You don't want to say to the patient, we're just going to go take a look. We're just going to open that up, look in there, see what happens. I think that's kind of a setup for um, an unhappy um, surgeon and probably an unhappy patient. So if we can commit to a specific diagnosis, if you feel fairly sure based on your history, your physical exam, and any workup or findings that they correlate with what you suspect is your diagnosis, that's going to go far for helping you be successful. The next thing is rule out patient-related factors. And this, again, kind of involves that type 4 group of patients that we were talking about. This is very important um, because these patients are known to have less than uh, stellar outcomes, and you don't want to be caught by surprise on that. And lastly, but not least, does the patient have reasonable expectations? There is no guarantee here that they will be completely pain-free. They can be better, they can be functional, but maybe not pain-free. I think that's an important distinction. And so if, if you have a diagnosis, you feel confident about your diagnosis, and the patient is in type you know, one, type two, or type three groups, um, and not a type four patient, and the patient accepts and understands the expectations, you're in a pretty good position to offer a surgery to this patient. So let's talk a bit about the types just briefly and uh, kind of go over some of the features of those types. Type one, again, was the inaccurate diagnosis. So what else could it be? Well, it could be arthritis. It could be radial tunnel, a synovial plica, an OCD, 
snapping triceps, instability, any of these would fall under this category. And I mentioned radial tunnel specifically because it has been shown to be the most common cause of type 1 failures. Werner showed that 13% of failures were related to radial tunnel not being appropriately uh, recognized. And it may coexist in up to 5% of patients. So there is a group that will have both lateral epicondylitis and radial tunnel, and they both have to be addressed in order to be successful. So how do we diagnose this? Well, I think there are three points that will be helpful, and they all are kind of a physical exam finding. One is pain to palpation at the arcade of Froch. Second is pain that's worse, worsened by resisted supination. And lastly, and, and importantly, a diagnostic injection of lidocaine can be very helpful in confirming uh, radial tunnel. And it's a very simple and easily done procedure. Electrodiagnostic studies may not um, be as helpful in the radial tunnel. They typically are not as helpful as they are in, say, a cubital tunnel or a carpal tunnel situation. So I don't think that that is your primary confirmatory tool, but I think the physical exam and your diagnostic injection will help you in this manner. Type 2 are the incomplete release or excision of tissue. And Dr. Mori showed that incomplete excision of pathologic tissue was the most common finding in type 2 patients. Nerschel reported that on 35 revisions done by his group, 34 had inadequate excision. And when that was fixed, 80% of that group had good results as a second surgery. So I think the point here is revision surgery is okay. It's a good thing. It's a good thing to offer if you are confident and you've kind of checked all those boxes that we talked about. And it can be very helpful and have a successful outcome. The type 3 patients are those that end up with a new problem after surgery. So they went in with tennis elbow and came out with instability, similar to our patient that we were just showing. The symptoms here may include weakness, numbness, catching feeling, a laxity feeling, a giving way feeling. Um, and you have to look for nerve injury. It could be radial nerve, PIN. It could be a synovial fistula. And commonly, probably most commonly, is damage to the lateral collateral ligament complex, resulting in that posterior lateral instability, which typically results from an overly aggressive debridement um, and uh, weakening or detachment of the lateral collateral ligament complex. Uh, and indeed, in our patient that I showed, that was in the situation uh, in, her, in her case. It also could be a subclinical infection that is just uh, causing continued swelling and effusion. Now, this type 4 group, again, the group that is the patient-related factors, um, this is a group you have to proceed with caution. Um, you have to kind of make sure there's the non-compliance, any psychological dysfunction, secondary gain issues, psychosocial issues. Uh, this group has uh, lower preoperative DASH scores, which have been shown to correlate significantly with anxiety and depression. And workers' comp patients are known to um, have higher pain levels and longer recovery periods when treated for lateral epicondylitis. So the, the take-home message for this group is proceed with caution, and avoid surgery for the most part, if you if you can. If you have shown that they don't have any of the other types, one, two, or three, and they fall into this group, um, it's okay to say no. It's okay to say no that, that the surgery is not gonna is not gonna be good. We're not gonna have a good outcome. I'd like to mention PRP just because it is currently a very popular treatment option for primary lateral epicondylitis. Um, but the question is, is it is it effective or not effective? And then we, we all kind of ask that question. And there's a lot of anecdotal reports uh, one way or the other from patients. But a study in 2020 with 119 patients where they compared PRP injections, autologous blood injections, and saline injections uh, with respect to the vast pain scores and the DASH scores at one year post-injection, they found no difference between any of the groups as far as their pain scores or DASH scores at one year. So PRP versus saline, the same. And they concluded that they would recommend against the use of PRP in patients with lateral epicondylitis. And this was, of course, done not in revision cases, but primary cases. However, it, it kind of is an interesting uh, question. It's an interesting um, result. And it would be interesting to see how this plays out um, in the future with PRP at the elbow. 
and talk briefly just for one slide here about the rehab protocol. And I, I don't put this in here to suggest that everybody has the same rehab protocol, but rather just to give you an overview of the time frame. I think that's the important point to take from this slide. I mean, depending on the pathology, this rehab protocol will be tweaked one way or the other. But in general, the 30,000 foot view is that, you know, it's a very slow recovery. Um, primary surgery is kind of, you know, the two to three month, but revision surgery may even be longer, four to six months before patients are able to return to their maximal resistive activities, like doing CrossFit, uh, weight training in the gym, bodybuilding type stuff, competitive racket sports, et cetera. I mean, this is just to set these expectations, I think is, is very important. So today our take home points, kind of going back to our objectives, we know it's not necessarily an inflammatory condition, but it is a healing response that is going on with lateral epicondylitis. The scope of the problem is perhaps low numbers, but the patients are challenging, often confusing and difficult. And it's helpful to define what this what a surgical failure really is so you know like are we are we just waiting for this to get better or do we actually need to move on to the next step and the three points with surgical failure is the pain level at the point where it interferes with with ADLs uh, with sleep disturbance with the quality of life is the duration at least 6 months from the index procedure maybe longer and is there any new pathology or new symptoms that we need to be alerted to Again, stress the waiting at least six months. These patients will come to you for second opinions way before six months. They may show up at two and a half months, three months, and they want something done. You have to be patient. Don't, uh, don't jump in too soon. The classification system, like types one through four that we talked about, can be very helpful to direct and kind of um, approach this in a logical fashion and help you sort out um, kind of what these patients are doing. Have a firm diagnosis, have good studies that kind of confirm and um, correlate with what you think is going on. I mentioned the diagnostic injection again, because I think it's underutilized. Um, it just takes two cc's and it can be very helpful, especially in the radial tunnel situation. It's a very good physical um, finding tip. And then the type four patients, again, be very cautious and make sure uh, you've kind of uh, done your due diligence before offering surgery to this group because the, the outcomes may not be to your um, satisfaction. And I think setting the expectations, it's twofold. Setting the patient's expectations for what to expect with pain, they are going to have some pain. 50% of them may have some degree of pain, even in, in a successful outcome. And the time frame again, revision surgery, perhaps four to six months before they can get back to what they uh, were doing before to those full uh, full activities. And I think if you can kind of cover all these bases, you will be able to help these people and have a, had a very satisfactory outcome. Thanks. Well, thank you, Kim. That's outstanding. Um, there's so much to talk about in the subject because it's so common, but, um, you know, and uh, we've learned so much over the last 20 years about maybe some of the advice from David Ring and others, uh, but, um, can I ask you, you know, in the last 10, 15 years, have you operated about the same amount on these patients or less and less as time's gone on? Or Because you, you're right, and your patients will come early, but it's sometimes hard. You know, they're suffering or, you know, they're perceived, perceiving themselves as, as suffering. And, you know, and, and uh, it's hard to say no to them sometimes when you don't have anything else to offer. Um and the other question I was going to ask is about is steroid injections. Uh, what is your take on steroid? And um, is there, uh, you know, we've been told time and again about cautionary tales related to steroid and its deleterious effects and too many steroid injections. How have you concluded that at this point? Yeah, yeah. So I think in answer to your first question, I think it's harder to say no to surgery than it is to say yes, by far. And the older I've gotten, the more I've, you know, more years that have passed, I realize that it's definitely harder to say no. Um, I think I probably operate on less of these patients than I used to, and when I first started, um, just because experience has, and maybe maybe I wasn't as um, 
critical about patient selection um, as I should have been. I kind of learned over time. So I think I think I operate on less primary cases, um, but I have to say, I don't know if it's a function of just being in the community a long time and having your name out there or not, but I get more of these surgical failure referrals than I used to get, right? And these people that are desperately looking for some help, like the patient I showed. Um, mm -hmm. So I probably take on more of those now just because I understand it a little bit better and I feel like I can offer them something, but I, it has to be very structured. And I think you have to be very stepwise in your evaluation of these people, um, okay. you know, because it, it it is a difficult situation. There's not, there's not a, 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 a huge volume of these people, but they're, they are very uh, time, they're time consuming. They have a lot of energy you have to take. You have to put a lot of time if you want a successful outcome in these patients. And I mean, they are, they're very grateful um, you know, for help, but they can be a challenge for sure. And they're high maintenance. Um, the second question, the steroid injections. I've become less and less enamored of steroid injections again, as I've gone, you know, in the years of my practice. I, I think it's kind of one of those false promises type thing. Um, I, I, I always teach patients and try to counsel them that the steroid injection isn't helping the healing. It's it's just providing a better environment for your body to do the healing, um, and it's it's a temporary situation. And I think we fall we get lulled into that. Oh, it feels better. I'm going to go back to uh, my CrossFit class, you know. And then, of course, we all know how that works. Um, so, I I am I am very cautious even in the primary, but in the revision cases. Maybe the patient could talk me into one injection, but that's about it. I mean, I, I really am not a fan of it for the revision, the revision cases. Yeah, you highlight so many good points. So, you know, patient selection and setting expectations, you know, that that dialogue ahead of ahead of time in the pre-surgery as you build up to potential surgery is so critical. Right. And I mean, and I I can't emphasize that enough for the young, you know, the young people in our audience tonight, because you know, it's you cannot backpedal. I mean, backpedaling is not going to go, it's going to make your clinics a nightmare. So you need to be straight with the patient up front and tell them, listen, this is how we're going to do it. If we do this, you're going to take four to six months to, before you even know if you're happy that you did it. And you, I would, I'll tell them you'll probably never be pain-free. Now, I mean, I would be, be happy if that's not the truth and if I prove myself wrong, but I, that's not where I set the expectation. I yeah. said, we're not trying to go for a home run here. We're trying to make you functional and you're going to have pain. And then at the three month mark, when they come in and like, oh, it's no better. It's no better. I feel terrible. I'm like, remember what we said? We talked about this. And, and, and it really, it really helps you manage that patient postoperatively. Yeah. Thanks again, Kim. Any questions from anyone else? Oh, we have a couple in the Q&A box that just came up. Um, would elbow scoping offer a proper visualization during revision surgery? And um, I guess they meant to say didn't mention armband, um, you know, the counterforce braces. Yeah. Um, I, I think the counterforce braces are helpful. I mean, I think they can be a helpful adjunct if you're, when you're in the process of trying to figure out what's happening and is, is this the same or different. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't think, I don't think they are magic in and of themselves, but I think as you're trying to work through um, starting from the most conservative approach and working up towards a revision surgery, they, they have a role. I mean, I think there's nothing wrong with using them. As far as arthroscopy in a revision situation, I haven't been a fan of it um, myself. I think that, um, you know, if you, if, if you kind of identify what went wrong and what happened and what needs to be fixed, it's just my preference to perhaps do that in, in more of an open setting. Um, but I mean, I don't have anything negative to say about it. I just, I just prefer to approach it a little differently in revision. Now, primary maybe, but not revision. I probably wouldn't use it. Thank you, Kim. And mm -hmm. um, Dr. Mago highlighted our, a discussion related to how miserable these patients can be and how individualizing and uh, good expectation, tempering expectations, and patient selection being critical. Oh, it's it's critical. I mean, these people will come in and they will, they'll, I mean, I don't know what your experience is, but I've had them, um, either they're so super angry, 
and they're and they're very angry because they're angry that they don't feel better. They're angry at everybody, or they're tearful because they're so miserable. And so, you know, you have to put your kind of psychologist hat on for a little bit first, just to kind of get the setting under control, and then you can actually start, um, you know, kind of evaluating. But yeah, they are miserable. They are they're and they're unhappy. And thanks, Jim. Okay, next up, uh, Dr. Poulos is going to share um, a very uh, interesting topic with a whole litany of possible hiccups that can occur. <laughs> Distal biases. <laughs> um, I just want to encourage everybody to use the Q and A. I, I know we got a couple there at the end, but certainly use it throughout the talk. Uh, speaking of CrossFit injuries, the, we're going to talk about complications after distal biceps repair. Um, at the end of my talk, I'm hoping that you'll be able to all recall the differences in surgical approaches and fixation strategies for distal biceps repair, identify common major and minor complications, and describe an approach for managing the most common complications. Um, like Dr. Mezzer was saying, I don't often see the primaries anymore. I see the revisions. And so when I talk to my colleagues about getting ready for this talk, I realize that some people either hate or love taking care of this. And if nothing else, the MRIs can be quite impressive. Um, and I always enjoyed taking care of the primaries, especially with the new uh, fixation strategies. I want to start with a case, which I think for those who don't see this or not in practice yet or still in training, um, highlights some of the more typical things that we can see. This is a 45-year-old right-hand dominant male, so sort of the right age group injured his left elbow a month prior while putting up drywall. Oops, sorry. Computer's going nuts here. There we go. Um, interestingly, non-dominant arm, and the studies used to say that dominant arm was the most common, but there was a recent Mayo paper that just was presented at the Academy that the non-dominant was the most common one they fixed. He felt a sudden pop, noted sharp pain and deformity, now with mild soreness and weakness that he complains of. Uh, he has a desk job, but he enjoys jujitsu and lifting weights, but you could certainly substitute CrossFit for that as well. Uh, and he's a non-smoker, which is certainly a risk factor for this as well. On physical examination, he was neurovascularly uh, intact. He had full active and passive elbow flexion and extension, but his elbow flexion strength was a little weak and painful. His tricep strength was full, pronation strength was full, and his supination was a little bit weak and also painful uh, with an abnormal hook test, which is one of the few tests out there that has reported 100% sensitivity and specificity. Probably worth repeating that study. Uh, he had an MRI, and I don't think you always have to get one, but certainly for someone who's a month out, that might make sense to talk about retraction. An ultrasound would be a good uh, alternative uh, depending on where you practice. But you can see 12 centimeters of retraction of the tendon here. He underwent surgical treatment, and uh, this isn't sort of the point of this talk, but you can see there the surgeon started with a mini limited open transverse incision distally, uh, and then made a counter incision proximally to find the retracted tendon. There's sort of that sheath that the tendon often lies in that was incised. And there you can see the tendon uh, actually being uh, identified in the proximal incision. Uh, and of course, this technique is uh, for more delayed um, presentations. Uh, but the fixation strategy is similar to how we do fix them, which is, uh, you see here, there's a locked barbed suture or a locked suture here, uh, that loop suture, um, that was then placed with a cortical, um, button. And certainly you can see these kits companies offer kits with this, um, includes now uh, a biotendesis suture, though I think that's falling out of favor. There've been some, uh, complications with osteolysis and fractures of the proximal radius. Post-operatively, he was splinted in uh, sort of more flexion than usual for two weeks, but then followed up at two weeks and complained of LABC uh, numbness. And so as we discuss this case and how uh, this complication progresses, I just want to back up a little bit and get everybody on the same page to appreciate that this procedure can be done a variety of ways, including two different common surgical approaches and multiple different fixation strategies. This was a good randomized control trial now 10 years ago. Uh, that showed their primary outcome, no difference in ASES elbow scores uh, at short or long term. But the authors did note a greater prevalence of transient neuropraxias of the lateral cutaneous nerve after the single incision technique. There's certainly many other complications to be aware of uh, as well. In addition to the LABC, there can be uh, nerve palsies or a decreased sensation in the SBRN distribution. Uh, a motor weakness with PIM palsies, 
There can be varying degrees of HO, many of which are asymptomatic, but it can progress to a radio ulnar synostosis, stiffness, and then re-rupture, sort of commonly cited complications. During the 2000s, the number of publications on this topic had grown exponentially with mostly limited case series. And so given the breadth of complications and relative high rates for some of the neuropraxies in the literature, Kane divided these complications into major and minor categories that you see here. And recently, I think there was a very well-performed systematic review uh, that brought together all these case series and comparative trials to better characterize the major and minor complications. And you can see here, they brought together and ultimately 72 studies, which represented over 3,000 procedures. The overall complication rate was 25%, and the major and minor complications here are split out for you. The most common complication overall is a lateral and it'll break your cutaneous nerve palsy. Uh, and this is a minor complication. The most common major complication was a PIN palsy resulting in weakness. In general, the major complications cause motor weakness or compromise the limb in some way, such as a vascular injury, which uh, I recently saw, which upsets the surgery center when you get one of those at the afternoon, a deep infection or a symptomatic HO. And you can see at this 25% complication rate, the vast majority of these, of course, are minor injuries. Given the large numbers in the review, the authors were able to perform a subgroup analysis where they found no difference among P rates of PIN injury by surgical approach, but all the radio ulnar synostoses you can see here occurred in the double incision group. Conversely, the LABC palsies, which uh, again is a minor complication or was uh, deemed a minor complication, was more commonly seen in the limited single incision approach. And this did reach statistical significance in their study. <clears throat> How about comparing uh, fixation methods? PIN palsy was the most common major complication, no matter what the fixation strategy was. However, there was a statistically significant difference in rates of LABC paresthesias between fixation techniques, with the cortical button having the highest risk of injury. And this might be associated with the limited single incision approach, and this is uh, often how it's used, but um, so maybe some confounding there. Overall, the reoperation rate was low with just one at 1%. HO was the most common indication for surgery, symptomatic HO. They were able to say that 64% of the LABC injuries in the systematic review completely resolved. Uh, and that makes that consistent with the traction mechanism injury. 10% of the patients had a persistent deficit of the LABC. And so unfortunately, that leaves a quarter of the patients with uh, where there was really no uh, resolution. I shouldn't say resolution. There was no documentation of whether it resolved or not. But I think we can safely say at least two thirds of the LABC uh, injuries uh, probably resolve. Notably important, I think, when you're seeing these patients, uh, especially the LABC injuries, is that out of over 400 nerve injuries in the 3,000 patients they saw, only five of these actually underwent surgery. We recently published a level five algorithm for treating iatrogenic nerve injuries. Um, rarely was it reported in the literature that the nerve was visualized in surgery, but certainly if uh, you identify a nerve that's uh, lacerated, um, then it may be able to be taken care of in the surgery itself, in the primary surgery. Um, thinking about other nerve palsies that you see, I would be more aggressive with motor palsies. The dogma, of course, is to get an EMG no sooner than three weeks or so to allow for Wallerian degeneration and more accurate electrodiagnostic studies. So I think if you see something like a PIM palsy, certainly around three or six weeks is probably reasonable to get electrodiagnostic studies. And I almost always add an ultrasound to that because I think that if you're going to work this up, it might be helpful to know the anatomy, depending on where you are and, and how your ultrasound um, radiologists are. I think where we are, it works very well to have, have me understand whether the nerve is entrapped or cut, what's happening. For sensory deficits, given the high rate of recovery, it may be worth waiting longer unless there is a specific concern that the surgeon mentioned in the... Um, operative case. And this is also another place where I like to highlight sort of a pet um, project of mine, which is uh, making sure you appreciate the second victim here, which is that uh, as hand surgeons, we often get referred cases like this uh, and being compassionate for the surgeon because no one feels worse about this well, than the patient, but then secondarily uh, is the surgeon. And I think the better we uh, treat our colleagues, the more likely they are to refer these to us early when we can do something about it. 
So for uh, our patient uh, who had the LABC uh, palsy or uh, weak uh, numbness at two weeks, when he showed up for his six weeks, this is totally resolved in his case, which is uh, the, uh, the norm. He began weightlifting and training at 12 weeks and back to competitive jujitsu at six months. The takeaways I want you to think about from the complications of distal radius uh, or distal biceps um, uh, repair are the number one complication is an LABC injury. And this uh, has been deemed a minor complication because it's uh, a sensory nerve, but this is the most common complication. The most common major complication is a PIN palsy. Uh, again, a very low rate of surgery, though, for both of these complications. And the number one reason for reoperation is actually a HO excision, symptomatic HO. And the incidence of re-rupture is low, regardless of your fixation technique. And so for all the surgeons out there on the line, I think the important takeaway here is to be familiar with the complication profile of your approach and fixation and do the one that you think will best serve your patient. Thank you, Nick. Um, points are well taken, of course. You know, the uh, like I said, it's tricky out there <laughs> around the elbow. And, and um, certainly uh, these patients, uh, you know, um, need to be aware of those risks, I think. You know, I've seen just about every possible complication related to this procedure, ranging from fracture to heterotopic bone to synostosis to nerve injury to lateral anal brachiocutaneous nerve as well as and even blood vessel injuries so um you know i guess i would say do you feel like there should be um you know for example you know i, I don't do as many of these as i used to largely because we become so subspecialized how, how much of this do you think is related to doing the reps and having uh, I mean, I, of course, this is somewhat intuitive, almost commonsensical, but I wonder how much of it is based on some of these complications being related to um, the frequency of, and has any of that been studied? You know? So I think that's a, a good point for sure. I mean, I think we know in most of the procedures in orthopedics, there's a benefit to doing lots of reps in terms of complication rates and outcomes. Uh, I'm going to start by backing up by a piece of literature that I didn't put in there, but the Mayo group actually put out in the academy had done an operative versus non-operative treatment of distal biceps and the non-operative outcomes were actually pretty impressive. Um, you know, the brief um, abstract I saw didn't put the age of, or function of the patient, which I think is probably important, but that's something to be thinking about because we fix uh, a lot of these, uh, not you and I per se, but I think orthopedic surgeons in general fix a lot of them. The fixation strategies have changed quite a bit and quite rapidly. You know, I think before the year 2000, there were 75 articles on this. Now there's hundreds. Yeah. And uh, as I mentioned, that kit started with a endo button with a tenodesis screw. And by the time I did it for my first time in practice and reached out to one of my mentors, they said, oh, I don't do the tenodesis screw anymore. So um, we're sort of learning as we're going. Uh, I think putting the endo button on the far side versus in the bone itself, these are all things that just are continuing to evolve. And uh, so I agree with you 100% about the reps. One of the problems with the reps, though, is if we keep changing the way that we fix yeah. them, then are we really getting, are we really getting the reps? Um, so I guess I'll leave it at that. I, um, you know, I, I think that you're touching on the really some really important points in terms of how we manage it. Oh, Chai has his hand up. Chai, uh, did you want to say something? Yeah, thanks, Marco. You know, I think uh, part of the reason, or probably a large part of the reason why we have these complication papers is that we have to stop being seduced by uh, the allure of wanting to restore uh, perfect biceps function through these very tiny incisions. And we are chasing after this... Uh, this mirage of restoring people to perfection when in all reality it does not happen. I mean, the best data suggests that even in the most uh, dominant sports athlete, the amount of power that you regain and endurance you regain is just about 90% on the dominant side. But yet here we are doing keyhole surgery and then wondering why we get all these complications. What is wrong against seeing what you're operating on? I mean, I know it sounds simplistic, but 
you know, if you want to operate adequately, make a large enough incision. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, yeah, and the times I've seen complications, it's often related to these sexy incisions that. that right. Are, you know, um, you, know uh, you highlighted a good paper, Nick, and uh, highlighting also Chai's thoughts that there's a great article by Mark Barrett and John Lubon looking at non operative treatment long term on these <laughs> patients. And, and it's pretty, uh, pretty compelling <laughs> for non op treatment. Um, we have some questions from the audience. Uh, I, hopefully, with time, um, I can help with some of these. But um, uh, first question is How successful is heterotopic ossification? Uh, for those of you who who've done heterotopic bone excision at this setting, it, it's, it's fraught with significant challenge and um, certainly the use of radiation and or uh, endomethacin uh, has been a staple when I do it. Um, but these are uh, challenging problems, uh, uh, particularly as it relates to potential complications of stiffness and, um, and nerve uh, uh, and uh, nerve vascular uh, compromise. Um, is a distal rupture more common with steroid takers such as bodybuilders as well as associated with collagen vascular disease? I'll leave that one for you, Nick. <laughs> well, we we'll certainly talk about it being associated with steroid use. I guess I don't know what the more common refers to, I guess, maybe proximal biceps. Um, you know, I don't have a, <clears throat> I don't know that I have a great answer for that. No, most of the proximal biceps uh, that gets done is probably by us in shoulder surgery, taking it down for other things. And, and there's certainly complications with that procedure, uh, as well, depending on how you uh, place that proximal tendon. Thanks Nick again. And, um, moving along here, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Anil Bhatt is going to uh, share his uh, presentation. Um, uh, Dr. Bhatt is kind enough to join us from England today. He's, uh, in, a, in Manipal, India, uh, and he's professor of head of hand surgery at uh, Kasturba Medical College, which is a hugely uh, high volume practice. And he's a world's expert on managing uh, these conditions. And uh, he was kind enough to videotape his, uh, his uh, presentation so that we could be streamlined, but would be available, will be available for questions as well. Um, thank you, Anil, for joining us. We greatly appreciate it. North America and Education Committee for this opportunity and especially Marco for giving this topic to me which is very close to my heart. Uh, I don't have any disclosures. But the earliest references about unicorns came from uh, Indus Valley civilization and the earliest references regarding the radial nerve and tracheal neuropathies probably came from in the 1950s. Uh, Thompson and Koppel's article talks about pegasus elbow itself being an entrapment neuropathy. Uh, they talked about ECRB and the slit in the supinate present, uh, which is more of a fibrous edge. And in fact, they told that this kind of anatomy is usually not depicted in the standard anatomical textbooks. And they thought that this elbow is part of the entrapment uh, neuropathy itself. A case report uh, by Kattner talked about the vulnerability of the PIN and how the fibrous sheath or the aponeurosis covers the supinator where the nerve is entering. Even though this was a lipoma compressing the nerve, they talked about these anatomical peculiarities which can compress the PIN itself. The world radial tunnel syndrome started coming into the literature, uh, especially with majorly it came with Rolls and Mosley's uh, uh, publication here in JBJS in 1972, where they described the anatomy of the radial tunnel in detail and also uh, they operated in about 31 patients. Most of the time, uh, these patients had activities involving repeated pronation and supination or forceful extensions. And they talked about how the surgical relief was quite good in many of these patients. So if you look at where the radial tunnel syndrome falls in terms of the presentation itself, it could be always confused with lateral epicondylitis or sometimes if the compression is too much, patients do present with uh, a motor weakness and this terminology of posidrosis nerve syndrome or even supinator syndrome should be very carefully used in these patients. Radial tunnel syndrome basically talks about pain, whereas the PIN syndrome or the supinator syndrome, it talks about palsy here with the motor weakness. And that uh, terminology differentiation has to be very clear. If you ask the question, is it a definitive interrapid neuropathy? Well, this particular 
uh, study by Van Rossum where all the NCBD EMGs were normal in all the patients of their radial tunnel, clinically diagnosed radial tunnel syndromes. Uh, they went on to say that surgical decompression should not be done because there was no evidence. However, they never gave any explanation for the pain and what is it due to or they didn't talk about the treatment itself in their series of patients. And the Louisville group, uh, Lister's and Kleiner's publication here actually uh, kind of contradicted that where they, they got complete relief in all their patients. In fact, they went on to describe very specific clinical tests and also the intro findings where they saw the nerve getting compressed during the pronosopination kind of when they mimic that particular movement and uh, where the arcade is actually pressing on these. And for anyone who asked about how can a motor nerve conduct pain, in their article itself, they answered that in terms of the PIN carrying sensory afferent fibers from the radiocarpal, intercarpal and CMC joints, and also afferent fibers from the muscle itself, their type 2A fibers. And anyone who can deny the possibility of mediated, uh, or the pain mediated by the motor nerves, they need to check only, you know, the recall their last attack of cramping or squeeze any muscle belly. And that's what they said. And this is recognized immediately by the patient with radial tunnel syndrome. And that's very true even now when we actually palpate the wad of mobile wad of Henry, a lot of patients do have a significant pain. We also know that unmyelinated and small myelinated fibers are not generally assessed with EMG and the existence of a defined anatomical space, a definitive tender area definitely suggests that there is a nerve involvement here. And this uh, latest publication 2020 by Jimbo Tang talks about how to define this radial tunnel because most of them have been quite vague as to the extent of the tunnel itself. And he goes on to say that the ending should be at the distal border of the supinator. So the tunnel basically is a spiral shape uh, covering the PIN at this particular area here. And five sides of potential compression, what is talked about is the fibrous bands between the brachialis and brachioradialis, the leash of Henry, the medial proximal edge of ECRP, the arcade of frost and the distal edge of the supinator itself. And most of the time the culprit is the arcade of frost. This particular dissection from our own anatomy department talk shows this leash of Henry and many of the articles talk about how there could be one major vessel uh, or sometimes smaller vessels actually you know intertwined with the nerve itself. The arcade of frost could be varied in terms of how thick the tenderness edges is and we also know that it occurs in about 30% of the adults and not seen in mature fetuses, which means that they might develop later on because of repeated rotational movements of the forearm. So Spinner's publication where they actually dissected the mature fetuses, uh, they didn't, they couldn't demonstrate any sharp tendinous uh, arcade of frost and it was actually quite muscular. And that's why we know that it actually develops later. And we have seen that in our own patients where it could be quite thick here like this, or sometimes it could be spread out like this throughout the entire muscle itself. So it varies depending on patients, probably activities, also different, you know, patients. The other culprit is the medial proximal edge of the ECRP. And uh, when, you, when we actually operate, we can actually feel the tightness of this particular muscle. And the distal edge of supinator can be a constricting point if it is quite tendinous there again. The basic presentation is always pain. Could be intermittent, could be kind of very uh, kind of vague with a heavy arm kind of fatigue kind of syndrome. Radiation, actually patients do complain of pain up and down like this. And the classic tender spot is always seen about five centimeters distal to the lateral epicondyle here. The other way to check is to compare the tender areas. There's a rule of nine test where these quadrants, the one and two where the PIN runs is compared with the opposite side here in the seven and eight and also to the opposite side also, and always compare the, the amount of tender tenderness a patient has. Classic tests are the middle finger extension test, which is the Morsley's test, which in their study, all of the patients had a positive test. And this is basically, they talk about how the, the fibrous, or the, play, the sheath of the ECRB itself getting tightened when we do this particular kind of a maneuver. The other one is, of course, the resistant supination test. Some of these actually overlap with the lateral epicondylitis test. And so it could be confusing sometimes. 
the classic tender spot is always always there uh, that is my personal experience too and this particular test again with uh, palm flexion and radial deviation and resisted kind of dorsiflexion always causes pain in the proximal part of the forearm there and uh, investigation wise most of the time electrodiagnostic studies are usually normal and cortisol injection with short acting local anesthetic might give a diagnosis by a sequential block some studies have shown some muscle changes edema and other changes and but the otherwise the neurophysiological studies generally have been normal except some of these studies where direct recording of the local pressure have shown that almost four times greater kind of uh, uh, you know pressure increase and intermittent nerve compression of this magnitude might actually actually cause the nerve damage and neurophysiological studies where they have compared uh, especially of nerve conduction during active supination and as well as emg differences between patients and controls where the differences were seen showed that there's an independent support for this kind of an entrapment hypothesis i think kupfer's uh, study where they actually uh, did uh, uh, radial motor nerve latency recordings uh, in three different positions of the forearm neutral passive supination and passive pronation uh, basically uh, tells about the uh, you know the concept that the dynamic condition requires a dynamic investigating kind of modalities and they did show differences in the latencies between the controls and in the cases and we have been using the same principle and we've been doing dynamic usg in our patients we take six images of affected and normal site in neutral pronation and supination and entry and in the tunnel we also look at the quality of the the nerve itself and also the leash of henry with a doppler uh, kind of an effect added to that and in different positions and we check what's happening with the vascularity also in these patients so that is the picture and we do get a report like this where exactly uh, we see the difference between in which particular position where the nerve cross sectional area is changing management wise non operative rest activity modification if you give them a tennis elbow brace actually it increases the pain that could be one of the clue that you are dealing with radial tunnel syndrome local steroids but there's no evidence a, a high level of evidence to suggest the duration of conservative treatment so and especially if patient has concomitant tennis elbow it can compound the decision making and your success rate can vary based on what kind of patients you are including this surgical wise decompression uh, could be couple, couple of uh, ways one is uh, through the brachioradial splitting incision itself or between the brachioradialis and the ecrl interval we go in the brachioradialis is always always uh, more reddish compared to the ecrl because of the thin sheath so that is the interval we need to go in and you can easily uh, use your finger to uh, get into that interval and by that manipulation you can actually go proximally and any fibrous bands between brachialis and brachioradialis or some fibrous bands uh, anterior to the radiocapitular joint can be broken down with this kind of a manipulation and once you uh, retract this interval you start seeing the ecrp the end of course then you start seeing the supinator itself the tendinous edge of the ecrp is what you need to look at and how tight they are or rather how tight it is and how it's compressing the nerve how close it is to the nerve and what exactly happens during the pronation and supination act, uh, kind of movements what happens to that nerve when it is just entering the tunnel itself at this point so that is where you need to check and also see how tight the ecrp is at patients with concomitant lateral epicondylitis and radial tunnel uh, this is an opportunity for you to release the part of the ecrp which takes care of when that particular uh, pathology in this patient and so during a pronation and supination you see how how tight it becomes you can actually put your finger there and feel the tightness of these patients well once you retract that uh, what you see is the arcade and that is where the nerve is entering here and this could be a, a very thin but tight fibrous band or it could be uh, are seen in different patients and that's that's my personal experience too this is dividing the arcade itself this is a one which i showed earlier which was kind of the tendon spread out throughout the muscle here so release of that completely and then you see Uh, what's happened to the nerve there a lot of times you might see this kind of constriction happening here and that's why your usg image is changed proximal to the tunnel and in the tunnel itself and again mimicking the real life situation of pronation and supination and seeing what happens to the nerve here and i also seeing what the ecrp tendon actually does to these nerve entry here at this point is is quite interesting in these patients leaf shaft henry could be quite prominent lot of vessels running across the nerve 
or it, sometimes it could be quite flimsy also but nevertheless it's worthwhile to coagulate these uh, vessels now if you have released the ecrp uh, in fact roles and modelies they are completely divided the ecrp but we just release it partially and then suture it back in a lax position here so patients do have some amount of extensor lag post operatively but they usually recover in about 3 to 4 weeks in these positions yeah, it, in in this particular time well to summarize radial tunnel syndrome should be looked in for all patients where there is a recalcitrant kind of lateral elbow pain and the indications of surgery hinges on reproducible physical findings along with clinical symptoms so please wait give them a good thorough trial of conservative treatment before going on for the surgery but surgical decompression has been quite rewarding in majority of our patients so if you ask is it a real uh, situation is it real entrapment or is it uh, something else well i guess the only the unicorns have an answer for that uh, one of the earliest description of unicorns actually comes from the indian subcontinent uh, in these rigvedic hymns here actually and uh, thank you so much for your attention and thank you so much for this opportunity here thank you yeah oh, thank you anil that's outstanding um you know and and you know, I, i think what you alluded to here about the not being a uh, timid about operating as actually born out in my practice you know when i first started my practice i was warned that this is something you need to really avoid and don't even touch these patients uh, you know sort of ignore them you know there were several articles sort of damning the uh, surgical treatment but over the years i found in the right patient and that you can really make a difference and one of the things that i found helpful in my practice and i would love your thoughts is the use of ultrasound and sort of showing focal compression of the nerve and, and how often have you used do you, do you have access to it do you utilize it and what are your thoughts on that um thanks marco yeah we we do rather we do uh, ultrasound routinely in all these patients uh, you know by default every patient undergoes ultrasound and as i showed it's it's a dynamic ultrasound which we uh, do in in all these three positions so in the neutral pronation and supination at the uh, entry of the tunnel and in the tunnel we take the measurements uh, it's difficult to take cross sectional area in the tunnel sometimes because the nerve is really uh, quite thin and the, the the sonologists might find it difficult to trace the uh, all around cord along the circumference but they would take the ap and the transverse diameter and so that's what we compared both ap and transverse both at the entry and in the tunnel again distally we did try to take the measurements but the nerve kind of really thins out at that point so uh, we, the i mean the, the sonologist who works with us who so a uh, trained musculoskeletal sonologist he after some time said it's probably not really uh, you know accurate what he he himself felt that it's not really accurate but the ultrasound is done in all patients and it also uh, we look at the lateral elbow itself i mean the epicondylitis features also plus this both together the report is given uh, for all these together yeah thanks and you know i'm sorry that i i remember that uh, i apologize um the um How often do you do both, in percentage-wise, treat the lateral epicondylitis and the uh, the the PIN? Yeah, uh, uh, we just finished a study of about thirty-three patients, and uh, in that, I would put the percentage of about our percentage is falling between about five to six percent uh, with the concomitant lateral epicondylitis. Any questions for Neil? Thank you Neil again it's a outstanding presentation and uh um I appreciate your encouraging results with it it reassures me Thank you thank you so much Thank you Okay so uh, next is um myself and uh we'll get started with my presentation um share my screen So my charge is to speak briefly on um the miserable um alacronombrositis uh, <laughs> which uh, unfortunately I see all too common largely because a lot of um uh, uh I have no relevant conflicts but largely because a lot of my um uh, uh our folks in the orthopedic community 
really, really try to avoid treating these. Um, by the way, the learning objectives, I, I hope that uh, we'd be able to explain the epidemiology and factors associated with olecranon bursitis, demonstrate the established treatment options for olecranon bursitis, and also uh, describe ways to mitigate uh, uh, complications associated and treat complications associated with olecranon bursitis. And sometimes you really can't avoid olecranon bursitis. Sometimes it's just so obvious. And, and this is a case of a patient with rheumatoid arthritis who who has these humongous nodules, and uh, we'll get back to him in a little bit, but the reality is that uh, it's hard to sort of try to avoid treating these surgically. Um, but for most cases, olecranon bursitis is uh, typically an inflammation of the bursa. Most of these are aseptic. Uh, about a third of these can be septic. The aseptic cases can occur from inflammation or reuse and even prolonged pressure. I, I'm sure that numerous uh, folks uh, have seen, if you're in practice long enough, someone who's been in a long arm cast for a long time or a sugar tongue, and they you unwrap the cast and you see uh, you see uh, an electron on bursa. The septic cases are, are tricky, uh, and, and largely because uh, if it, an infection breaks out in the, serp, in the bursa, it can lead to osteomyelitis and significant morbidity. Almost universally, these are due to some kind of penetrating trauma. It's, uh, um, uh, and, uh, but I have seen cases of uh, disseminated infections that have seeded in the bursa, and I'll share some as well. Um, the most common organisms for these, when they're bacteria or staph, uh, aureus and staph happy, although when seen in a disseminated setting, you can see it with uh, mycobacterial infections and even fungal infections. <clears throat> the incidence is about 10 in 100,000, although certainly we don't know the, uh, the numerator quite well, but this is our best estimate, males more than females in 30 to 68 years of age. But also you can see them in uh, um, atypical or less common ways, uh, rheumatoid, gout, uh, lupus, uremia, and again, infection. This is a case of gout here uh, in the lower right, and I mean, uh, of uh, gout, and this is a, 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 um, another rheumatoid nodule. X-rays can be uh, uh, somewhat helpful. They sometimes will show an electron on spur, um, um, but the soft tissue shadow is often common. Uh, the dual energy CT can uh, identify gouty crystals if you're suspicion for that, and MRI is particularly helpful in cases of infection. The mainstay of treatment is non-operative, ice compression, immobilization, aspiration injection, and, and, and surgery can be used. I, I'm a big fan of immobilization. It's sometimes hard to trick patients or convince patients, trick patients. It's sometimes hard to convince patients to go with immobilization, but it's very, uh, I think it's very helpful in minimizing uh, recurrence. And this is an article from uh, Hera Meals from about 10 years ago that, that sort of suggests uh, how many surgeons view this. Um, you know, most electronom bursitis is managed supportively. Um, most surgeons are reluctant to perform uh, any percutaneous drainage or surgical excision uh, for fear of causing chronic uh, draining sinus or infection. And I have some colleagues who just refuse to operate on these patients, which can be unfortunate. Um, this is an article from way, way back, looking at a retrospective review of 47 patients who had chronic electron bursitis. They had uh, two categories of patients, uh, 25 had aspiration with injection, 22 had aspiration alone. Um, their results were actually pretty good. Um, they did find faster resolution in the steroid group, which was dramatically faster. However, the injection group also carried a higher risk of complications, including bursitis, skin atrophy, and chronic pain. Um, and other complications have been cited with uh, injections, including uh, uh, tendon rupture. Uh, this is a, a randomized study uh, from 2016 uh, comparing compression, aspiration only, and aspiration with injection from Kim and colleagues, 133 patients, very large series. Um, and what they found was that there was um, a, um, a significant uh, um, uh, relative risk ratio, I'm sorry, my box is in the wrong place, the relative risk ratio for uh, the um, aspiration with steroid was, uh, um, was um, oh, aspiration alone was, uh, was higher and statistically significantly higher for uh, um, uh, recurrence. 
And uh, they had um, basically very similar outcomes in terms of time. Uh, the time to improvement was, uh, was lower in the patients with injection, uh, much like the previous study. And uh, they thought that factors associated with failure were longer duration of symptoms prior to treatment. And interestingly, there were really no complications, including infection, persistent drainage, or, or, uh, um, uh, or uh, uh, wound healing problems. Quail and Robinson suggested just removing the electronon process was a good idea. Uh, leave the bursa intact, minimizes the risk of creating these fistulas or, or chronic draining sinuses and had no recurrences in a fairly small series, although they had a couple patients with hyposthesia. Um, and uh, a prospective randomized study comparing endoscopic treatment versus open revealed that uh, the, the endoscopic group fared much better. The open group did uh, worse, but not all studies are similar. This is another study showing uh, maybe not so good results in a very small series. Um, to get back to the extrabursal treatment, uh, Greg Bain uh, uh, reported on an uh, endoscopic removal uh, where you don't uh, treat the bursa, you just treat the, the bone underneath, and they thought it minimized the risk of uh, prolonged sinus formation. Uh, this is an important article as it highlights the complications that we see, and I would encourage everyone to give it a read. Um, unfortunately, the results in this uh, series were fairly poor. Uh, recurrence rate was substantial, and the recurrence uh, and the wound healing problem rate was uh, quite substantial. One case actually ultimately required a significant flap, uh, a free flap of sort. I mean, a lateral arm flap, not a free flap, but a lateral arm flap to to uh, to um, treat rotationally. Um, there, there are other complications, infections, pain, uh, stiffness, and painful scar. The biggest uh, uh, treatment that I've gone to in patients who have chronic wounds and, and failures is typically related to um, the use of an anconius flap, which I'll highlight. That's a 48-year-old uh, uh, male who had uh, electronon bursitis and two previous in, uh, uh, surgeries. Um, and unfortunately, this ongoing sinus with an uh, uh, infection. And um, you elevate, the, it's fairly easy flap to raise. You can expose the anconius, elevate it, free it up. You, you certainly want to drop the tourniquet to make sure that it's uh, bleeding appropriately and, and use it to cover the, uh, the, um, uh, the electronon. Uh, it's important to have a big enough incision to get the primary closure and free up skin flaps wide enough so that you can get uh, uh, a good primary closure and ultimately you can get pretty good results. Now, this is a case of uh, also an electronon uh, bursitis that's associated with a disseminated mycobacterial infection, uh, Marinum. And I met this patient about two years ago, and you can see she has pretty advanced uh, uh, mycobacterial infection in the hand. It's spread all the way up to the elbow and included the electronon bursa. As you can see, she's got bursitis. Um, and uh, after numerous uh, surgeries, uh, probably three total, she, um, she ultimately went on to heal and uh, long-term antibiotics. And she actually coincidentally came back to my clinic today and uh, you can see that a good result can be obtained through surgery. Uh, you know, they can, uh, um, um, with appropriate uh, uh, diligence and wound care and, uh, and uh, surgical treatment, you can actually get a pretty good, um, pretty good result. Long, takes a while. This was a one and a half years later. My thought in treating these is uh, immobilize and of course exhaust the non-operative treatment if it recurs. Uh, and of course, if it's infected, then I, uh, um, uh, surgery, I'm more prone to want to uh, pursue quickly. But if it's symptomatic, um, my reluctance for surgery is actually not that bad. I would actually turn the, uh, the attitude a little bit to say that uh, I've just from repetition developed a uh, confidence in treating these. Uh, to me, the key is immobilizing them. Uh, it doesn't have to be in full extension. It could even be at 90 as long as the skin edges and skin flaps are okay. But I do it for a minimum of three weeks and patients will get their motions back and uh, these wounds will heal better. Uh, the use of a drain is, uh, is helpful in many of these cases and I would encourage, uh, encourage that as well. Uh, and following these patients closely, making sure that you're mitigating uh, wound problems, I think is hugely helpful. 
uh, and, uh, and sort of stemming the tide of anything that's going in a negative direction. So this is our original case of the patient, and you can see he had a fairly large uh, uh, bursal sac that uh, was successfully treated. Uh, in summary, electron bursitis is common. Non-surgical treatment is the mainstay. And again, aspiration I'm, I'm, uh, I use uh, for uh, uh, hopefully uh, therapy, but also it can be diagnostic. I tend to avoid steroid injections, uh, even though they can show reduced time to recovery. Uh, surgery uh, I will uh, pursue. Uh, uh, and thankfully, most, uh, most results can be pretty good, despite the fact that uh, you know I caution folks that complications can be uh, significant. Um, and um, I tend to treat the infections uh, uh, very aggressively if I can to minimize the risk of, uh, of uh, osteomyelitis and uh, further morbidity. Um, thank you. I, you know, I think we're almost, uh, or we're out of time, right? Um, so I'm not sure that we're going to have enough time to share a case, uh, um, but I would be certainly happy to do so. Um, Marco, I have a question for you. I think that was very interesting. Um, you know, a situation I run into as far as these patient referrals is they they often come from maybe their internist or um, just a general orthopedist, and they've they they have been aspirated so many times. Or I mean, what is your feeling about aspiration? I mean, I, I tend to be not in favor of it as much. I mean, what do you think, or what is your experience with that? Yeah, I only do it once, uh, Kim, and, and uh, you know, these, uh, and we've all seen it where they get these draining sinuses. Uh, I, I would not do it more than once. And, and to be frank, if, uh, if someone is reluctant to uh, be immobilized for a while, I might, I might force them to immobilize before considering an aspiration just to sort of make sure that, um, you know, we might be able to uh, mitigate the need uh, down the line. Um, I'd be curious to see what other people's opinions and experiences are. Um, uh, I am a big fan of avoiding steroid injections for sure, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I have patients come in and they, they come in saying, I want this taken off. I mean, that's, and I, I tend to be a little more conservative, but I, I have to say that many patients come in with the assumption that we're scheduling surgery right away. I don't know if you run into that scenario as well. Uh, yeah, I do. Uh, and I have a lot of patients who will say, you know, I, I can't find anyone to help me. It's a little bit like those tennis elbow patients, you know. Yeah. You know no, patients, this, this is uh, true. Go from place to place and, and uh, it's hard to sometimes say no to them. But true. I, I, I think to me, uh, getting them on board with expectations and also getting them on board with this immobilization, which really you know, I scoured the literature looking at how often uh, people advocate immobilization, and it's not really described very much. I was surprised to see. Yeah, um, I think it's under um, utilized. I mean, I think postoperatively, I echo your your um, you know point about postoperative immobilization. I think that's that's huge for soft tissue stabilization. We did get a request in the Q and A to present the case. Maybe I'll I'll try to rush through it in three minutes or five minutes if that's okay. Um, is that okay, Try? Yeah, three minutes. Sure. Um, so uh, this is a case example: a 58 year old male with left elbow who underwent this surgery, um, and uh, uh, he had had. Uh, share your screen, Marco. Marco, can you share your screen? Oh yeah. Excuse me. Sorry. Trying to go quickly here. Um, can you see that okay? Uh, go to just presenter and then we'll be ready. Ready to go. Looks good. So this is his surgery. And um, he um, he noticed after surgery that he could not extend his thumb and his, uh, and his um, index through small fingers. Um, and uh, he was told to give it time. And he did give it time. Uh, and ultimately, um, at three months after surgery, he was referred uh, to us. Um, so in terms of how we address this, you know, uh, and I, I'll try to go quickly through this, you know, I, I think an EMG is often helpful in this case, particularly at that time. One of the questions I was going to ask the panel is, uh, what do you do if, if you see this post-op day one? What do you do if you see this in the PACU? Um, is this something, how would you, how would you approach it, Nick? Would you, 
would you offer them a wait and watch or what do you think? I think it's hard if you examine them postoperatively uh, in the PACU. Um, we talked about before the panel about what kind of anesthesia uh, you use for this, and that certainly can complicate this if you're using a regional anesthetic technique. Uh, I think if you have real concern that it's related to something anatomic and that's your fixation, then getting ultrasound is reasonable. But I'll be honest, Marco, I probably would um, see it at uh, two weeks. And then at three weeks, three to six weeks, I'd be starting to think about my EMG if their PA had really hadn't recovered. And I would add on an ultrasound to your EMG, uh, as I kind of talked about in my talk as well. Gotcha. Gotcha. Kim? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I, I would like to get a, you know, a very good exam. So in the PACU, I mean, that's okay. But I probably wouldn't just take them back at that point. Um, I would perhaps get a good exam within the first week. I mean, something really good. And then if I had, you know, everything was out, I, I would probably tend to have a low threshold to go back in. I mean, especially if I, I was, you know, if I guess if I wasn't the one that did the primary procedure, then I, I would maybe not be as aggressive, but if it was my complication um, and I, and I knew what I knew and I saw what I saw, you know, I mean, I felt confident about the technique I would probably have a low threshold to go in early. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because you don't look at the nerve when you do these single incision mm -hmm. approaches. Whereas if you do a two incision, like we used to way back in the day, you, yeah. you can be a little bit more sure of what you saw, what you didn't see. And, and that they bring up a good point about, Hey, you know, I, I, you know, I tried to be gentle as I could and tried not to plunge and try not to, yeah. but you don't know because you're not seeing it. And that's uh, that's a critical mm -hmm. point. Um, yeah, so this patient underwent a, an EMG uh, uh, at that point, uh, which showed, uh, you know, what we expected, you know, and, um, and also had an ultrasound, which showed that the PIN could not be separated from the scar tissue surrounding uh, the endo button. So with that in mind, a, a surgical approach was performed, and this is what we saw intraoperatively. This, um, um, oh, this is what my colleague saw. This was uh, before it was referred to me. Uh, so the, you can see the button is right over top of the nerve. <laughs> and uh, so the, the button is uh, now removed, and the nerve itself is um, like this. Now at this age, I mean, we have two options we have. I'm going to try to move things along. We could try a nerve reconstruction. Um, it's not likely you could do a primary nerve repair with the, the way that looks. And um, the other option would be to do a tendon transfer. Um, and in this case, uh, they, they opted to, um, to refer to me for tendon transfer. And that's what we ultimately ended up doing. Um, but you could do a, a nerve graft, like this case, as different case uh, example, um, or you could do a tendon transfer, taking the uh, FCR to the EDC and palmaris longus to the EPL. Um, and ultimately, he went on to do well with that. And then we, we, his biceps became still problematic, and ultimately he underwent revision for uh, the biceps, which at this point was six months after the uh, the nerve, uh, I mean the tendon transfers for the wrist, and required an Achilles allograft for reconstruction. Uh, and so ultimately, this this fellow had three surgeries after a attempt at biceps tendon. Um, and I, I know it was a quick going through the case. There could have been a lot of dialogue, but. I think some of the points we discussed are obviously very important in terms of how you proceed. Um, one thing I've learned also is if I have someone with a neurologic deficit after a, a surgery of any kind, I, I sometimes will uh, sort of not do anything based on the anesthesia or the tourniquet time and sort of, but I check in on them in a couple of days, say, hey, how are you doing? You know, and sort of get a sense of where they are and what they're doing this way you know, you're asking them to think about things because many patients, uh, you know, not many, but some patients don't even know they have a deficit when they're in the splint. They're not using their hand. They don't know. And it's in a CSI Miami kind of way. It's nice to sort of see how things are trending. And, and uh, I think that I've learned that that's one pearl that uh, helps, I think. Um, all right. I think we're out of time. Thanks, Jai, for letting us squeeze that in. Um, 
Um, yeah, a couple comments from the last few questions. How do you avoid entrapping the PIN? Uh, well, <laughs> that's a good. That's a good question. Uh, you want to try to avoid plunging. You want to make sure that you can um, you can sort of uh, get a, a, a nice. Uh, I mean, to me, I think having a avoidance of that plunge and getting a feel for that button. I don't do it this way anymore uh, for reasons like this. Uh, I tend to use a uh, a fast uh, 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 fast hack, uh, the Arthur Arthur X, uh, and which is unicortical and sort of finds a nice spot in there. Um, but. Uh, Certainly, uh, if a lot of people still do the endo button, but uh, um, also going as uh, as um, as Nick alluded to, maybe going more radial uh, in terms of the position. Oh, is that right, Nick? Is that your thought? Or yeah. yeah, I think that's right. There's some good anatomic studies, and I think as you said, unicortical versus the bicortical button fixation um, is becoming more common for people who are concerned about this. Yeah, I mean, I've gone to the unicortical as well. Yeah, so, uh, and I think that there's good science. And, and as Nick says, it might change again. You know, we've had so much. You could fill this room with research on bi distal biceps. It's a very popular subject um, that uh, you can see a lot of, uh, uh, if we can stay consistent, we'll really get good data, I think, <laughs> about how we treat them. Uh, thank you again to, to a wonderful faculty. Thank you all for um, mm -hmm your time and your patience. I'm sorry I went late, Abby and Max, um, and try and um, have a great day um, and a good evening, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Thanks.